plan your next move like a chess game. So first off, let me talk a little bit about who I am and why you may be interested in listening to me specifically talk to you about this. First off, uh, I've been a software developer and in the IT tech field since 1996. Started off as a, as a software developer, did com custom application development for clients. And then uh, I taught programming to a bunch of people and I've worked at startups, mid-sized companies, large companies and uh, even owned my own business for a while as a partnership. That went really great. I'll show you how that was later. Um, right now, I am a product manager at OC Tanner, and I am doing that while also going to school, uh, getting my MBA. Uh, personally, I've taught leadership principles to a number of different uh, people from uh, many different companies. Uh, did that for about 15 years as a volunteer. and. Uh, and I've got a shodan, I wish Matt was here, because I could say Aikido, and then he would actually understand what that was. Oh, there he is. Um, and then uh, I'm certified advanced open water diver for patent. When I first started as a, as a developer in the industry, I had a, I had a specific mental model, and that specific mental model was that my career had to follow a ladder. I start off as a junior software developer, and you move your way up to an actual software developer, and then gradually move up in the ranks, so to speak. And uh, it wasn't until uh, a number of years ago that I, I heard a, a guy say that you should look at your career not as a ladder, but as, as a chess game. And so as I, after I heard that, I thought a lot about it and thought, OK, how do you manage your career like a chess game? How does that work? What does that look like? And so what I'd like to do is share a little bit about some of the thoughts that I've had since I've heard that phrase and how I've started to manage my career more like a chess game instead of as a ladder. So first off, let's talk about the actual chess board and, and the way that it's arranged, right? We've got ranks and we've got files. Or we've got the horizontal axis and we've got the vertical axis. So along the horizontal axis, we have specialties or specific industries. So for example, you might be involved in healthcare, or you might be involved in retail or finance or have experience, you know, you're developing applications in these specific areas. Or you may have specific areas where you're really focused on. So for example, you might be machine learning, or you might be in software architecture optimization. Um, a lot of different things, product, QA, those are also different specialties that we can kind of map along each one of these, like an A, a B, a C, or a D. Then we have the vertical axis. So the vertical axis going up the chain is very much still like that ladder. But in some respects, there are little differences. So for example, your job title could be one of those steps along the rungs of the ladder. But it could also be the role, the responsibilities that you're being given. So for example, Let's say that my job title says that I am a junior software test engineer, but I'm given a responsibility to actually lead a team and help them deploy a particular solution to our, our environment. So that necessarily isn't necessarily, that's not something that a junior software developer would actually be doing. That's more of a, a tier up or even a little bit above simply because of the role, the responsibility that that particular project and role gives me. And it may not even be a QA thing. Maybe it's a DevOps sort of a thing. So I get experience in not only, let's say that as a junior test engineer, I'm on A2, for example. That responsibility could actually be maybe a B4. And so I'm getting, re I'm getting experience in different areas in different levels. And that's, that's how I've started looking at the, the chessboard itself. One other thing um, that's helped me with this mental model is getting experience in a number of different areas. There was a, there was a study done, um, and I think it was published in the Harvard Business Review, that talked about how we grow professionally in our careers. And they broke it down, 70% of our growth in our career comes from the experiences that we have. And then 20% of our growth comes from the people that we know. You know, it's, it's not what you know, it's who you know, right? Well. Apparently, it's only 20% of the people that you know. 
And then 10% is education, which makes you wonder why I went back to get my MBA. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so with those two things, the, mem the mental model of the chess game and then this 70-20-10 rule, let's take a look at some tools that can help you as you actually map and make these different moves on the chessboard to get the experience that you want to get to the place that you want. So first off, we'll skip this slide, we'll go to the personal experience map. Personal experience map is a collection of experiences that you would need in order to get to your end goal, the things that you want to do in life. There are two types of experiences that you want to look at. First off are your functional experiences. This is like I've got six years as a Rails developer and I have done monolith deployments or I've done microservices. These are kind of your competencies and the skills that you've got. And then you've got your management um, things, which are more like that, uh, that uh, example that I sh talked about before with the, the engineer doing, leading a team, getting something deployed. That's actually your management experience. So you've got skills and competencies, and then you've got the management experiences, the experiences in working with people, leading teams, or helping to get people moving in a direction. So the question then is, what kind of experiences do you want to get? And the, the answer to that is you ask people. So you interview experts. So you go at, uh, you go off and you look at trade journals. You go off to conferences. You go and take a look to where the people are that are doing the things that you want to do, and you talk to them, ask them. What is it that you have done that's led you to this particular position in your career? Why, why did you do this thing and not that thing? And ask them some of the things that helped them grow the most. What is it that you did that gave you the biggest bang for your buck? Um, a number of years ago, uh, at OC Tanner, we had Sandy Metz come in. And I don't, anybody know who Sandy Metz is? Okay, good. Just checking. <laughs> so we had Sandy Metz come in, and, and she was giving kind of one of these uh, trainings to, to our Rails uh, Ruby developers there at the time. And we asked her, so how did you get into this? What did you do? And she said the best thing that she could do, the, the best, she, the advice that she gave us, and said, she said, the best thing that you can do for your career is write a book, which I thought was really interesting. The best thing you can do is write a book. And so uh, I did that. I haven't published it. You know, it's sitting there on my hard drive like many other things that I've done, including many of my pet projects. It's, it's there. But write a book and probably get it published and probably be the next thing she would say. But that's one of those things that you should ask those experts. Ask them what they did. What is it that's most influence or impact your job and your career? Um, and then you can do something else, which is LinkedIn stock them, which is for those of us that are a little bit more introverted. Go check out their resume, look at their LinkedIn, and see what kinds of things are they listing as the most important things on their resume or in their LinkedIn. So for example, if they say, I, I implemented this system that had, I don't know, I'm going to blow up sort of things. But let's say that they, I ran my own company, and for 15 years, we had a project that helped service this energy company down in California. And you can say, OK, and that's on their resume because they think that's an important aspect of what they did for their particular job. So think about ways that you can incorporate what those experts have done as well into your own career navigation. Finally, building the map. You'll want to take a look at four to seven functional experiences and then three to four manager experiences and incorporate those into where you're going to actually go in your, in your goals. And then finally, they should show a meaningful business outcome. So for example, when people look at your resume, it's nice to know that you have six years of experience, but what did you do? Did you increase the amount of profits that the company received? Because they like to see how much actual impact that you had on the company that you were working for. Or we, re we reduced the amount of uh, response time that it took for our web page to actually be returned to, to people. Or we increased the amount of people that were actually concurrent users on our system from 100 to 10,000, for example. Those are things that you can actually quantify and show them with data that they, they can then appreciate. 
finally, with your experience map, you're going to your career is going to be very much a journey, and you'll want to review it uh, rather regularly. Um, every two to five years, you can update it. Uh, not two to five years. Every six months, you want to update it, and uh, you want to make sure that your focus is still the same and can help you get to where you want to in the next two to five years. Another tool besides experience mapping is your from to interviewing. And this is really simple. Uh, it should be, it's a very tactical thing. And your idea is that you're gonna start with, where am I at right now? So where's my from? And where do I wanna move to? What's the next step? So am I gonna move, um, am, I, am I gonna move along the horizontal axis, or am I trying to move along the vertical axis? It's really difficult to do both at the same time. If I wanted to go vertically and horizontally, say, so for example, if I want to move from, say, a senior software developer to a director of operations at healthcare, at a, health, at a new company, that's going to be a lot more difficult for me to do as opposed to maybe moving up the chain just a little bit to, in my own company and then moving over to that healthcare company. That, I hope that makes sense. You can also look at what technologies you want to use. So just industry is not necessarily one of the things I can move across, but I can move across based off the technology. Maybe you want to learn another language. Maybe you want to learn machine learning, which is learning, learning, learning. Um, maybe you want to Maybe you want to get into embedded system programming. These are all different things, right? And we start pet projects on these things specifically so that we can do those things. But maybe your company or there might be a, an opportunity within your company or your job which would allow you to do that thing. So if you can leverage that and convince your boss, that's great. The from to statement is really simple. From a blank, I want to move to a blank. So. From a pure backend developer, I am going to move to a full stack expert with a focus on Rails and React. Or I can go, that statement could also look like from an individual contributor who adds value through technical exper expertise to a leader who provides vision and direction through clear collaboration on technical architecture decisions. If that isn't a mouthful, I don't know what is. But it gives you direction on what your next step is and what direction you're going to be going in that either horizontal or vertical move. One of the other tools that you can use is interviewing. So this is, you know, think about a radical candor kind of an idea. You're going to ask colleagues and supervisors for feedback on this statement that you have. So do you think this is realistic? Am, am I really cut out to do, go from a technical expert to a leader of team of people? And they'll tell you, hopefully. They'll be honest, and, and they'll help you. But the idea is that you'll be able to take the feedback that they give you and incorporate that into your plan. So if I need to work on how I interact with people, then that's great feedback, because then I can work on that. And maybe as I, as I work on how I interact with people, and maybe I'm, I'm going out and I'm visiting with people more, then that's that can be one of those things that as I work toward that next step, I have a plan. Finally, this is uh, probably the, the biggest part of, uh, of what I've used is matrix ranking. So matrix ranking is designed to take the guesswork out of a position or a job opportunity. You decide what criteria is most important. So let's take a look at a sample from my personal matrix. So these are the things that are most important to me and how I've weighted them. Uh, we've also got the criteria with sample questions and then overall ranking. So we'll take a look at each one of these in turn. First off, the criteria and the weights. You don't have to have all of these. They're your personal things. What are the mo things that are most important to you in a job? For me, financial is important, but obviously you can see it's not as important as time off. And my point my, the way I qualify this is, at a certain financial point, if, like if someone's going to offer me $10 an hour flipping burgers, that job is just, it gets thrown out. It's not even considered. So I'm not even going to consider that as one of the opportunities that I'm looking at. However, if they're going to offer me close to where my salary is right now, 
then I would consider that and it would go into this bucket and then financial consideration would be 8% or rankings, if that makes sense. So that's kind of the financial benefits is obviously the same. So go through, think about what are the things that you want most in the job? What are the things you like most about the job that you're in right now? And, and rank them. So when I started off, I just divided them equally and said 10, 10, 10 because I had 10. And then I went through and I said, this one's more important, so I'm going to add a couple percentage points. And this one's less, so it'll take, two, take a couple off until I got to this particular weighting. Yours, your mileage may vary. Then I went through and I've created a, a spreadsheet that has each one of those, those particular pieces. So for example, schedule, if we look back, schedule was at, down at the very bottom, 15%. So then I took, took a look and said, okay, based off of what I think is important with the schedule, what would I rank a five? Like this is the best job ever as far as looking at a schedule. And then a three would be, this is basically what I expect out of a schedule nowadays. And then a one would be, this is awful. I would really not work for this kind of a, a job. So for example, 60 hour plus work weeks on a regular basis is not something I'm looking to do. Um, occasionally, sure, but not all the time. And I've worked at jobs where that was expected. So then uh, come up with some questions that will help you answer that. So you know how you get into a job interview. I don't know. Maybe I'm the only one that's like this. But you get into a job interview, and somebody asks you, so do you have any questions? And I'm like, uh, I, have, I have no response to that. Right? This prepares you for that eventuality. This lets you have some specific criteria-driven questions for what you're looking for in your ideal occupation or your ideal position. So you can go into a job and say, actually, yes, I've scoured your website and I found answers to some of my things. Like you can find some benefit information on some websites. You can find some, you know, the salary, you kind of have an idea, but you want to find out that one for sure. And there are other things you can maybe find out about the culture of the company as you're just in there and walking around. But eventually you have to ask them some questions. And so these are the questions that you would ask. And then based off of the responses, you say, well, yeah, he's probably, a, this company is probably a three, or this question, this particular position is a five, depending on what you want. And then you map them out. So then, so for example, this is me with my dream team of, uh, of jobs, and some, some of them like game retail store owner. It's always one of those things I toy with because I like to play games. Now. Is it going to meet the salary one? It's probably a one. But it's there for completeness. Also, take, take, a, take the current position that you're at and throw that in there too. Make sure that you include that in there because your best decision may be to actually not move at all because that may end up being the rank, the one with the biggest ranking, best ranking. So you may be perfectly fine where you're at and that's totally okay too. Uh, and what you want to do, and this is on my website, so if, uh, you know, at the end I've got a link to this actual spreadsheet so you can download it if you want to and customize it, do whatever you want. So don't worry about trying to create this on your own because it's a pain. Um, but you'll, you basically put in the weightings. So your salary, 30%, you just put in your five, you put your benefits in at two and your time off. Basically throw in the rankings and at the very end it's got a total column, sort it, and you know, okay, this is the one that's the best for me. So summary of the tools. We've got the experience map that kind of tells you where you want to go based off of what you've seen experts doing and where they are and what you kind of want to be like them or a combination of them. We've got from to and interviewing, so where I'm at right now and where I'm going to move to. And then we've got the matrix ranking. But the question really is, why do you want to move at all? Or, uh, or as I like to call them, the three Bs. So the first B, and this is where I maybe open up the kimono a little bit, is your bump in salary. So I did fade out some of my actual salary numbers. I meant that. But what I am showing you are the bumps that I've had in my salaries since 1996. Every time I've had a bump in salary, it's because I've either changed positions or I've changed companies. The worst person I've ever worked for 
is an orange, which is me. I am my worst employer. I didn't give myself a raise. I, you know, I didn't even bump my salary up from moving to my previous position. So as you look at a possibility of going off on your own, consider that as well. Because it may not be the best thing for your career, but it may not. It may be, it may not. It depends. Um, there are a lot of benefits to working for yourself. And uh, the time off, the flexibility in schedule are, are some benefits that, honestly, the change in salary is not as important to me. And so not getting that bump is OK if you think it is. So would I go back? Maybe. But bump is one of the Bs. The other bump is burnout. Um, at the last Mountain West conference, Jameis shared a really personal story that he had about his experience with burnout. And um, one of the things that really struck me about that talk was that at that time, I was also going through burnout. And his openness on how he came back from that was very helpful to me because it showed me that there was hope at the end of the rainbow, or rather tunnel, not rainbow. There was no rainbow. It was the opposite of a rainbow. There was, there was hope at the end of the tunnel. And, and maybe a change in what you're doing can help you move away from that burnout. Maybe you're tired of doing what you're doing. Maybe you're tired of that repetitiveness. Maybe changing it up just a little bit will help you. So maybe instead of, instead of working on embedded systems, you want to work on a Rails app. Or instead of working on a Rails app, maybe you want to work on some machine learning. Maybe you want to get more involved in some of the optimization pieces of the, of the hardware or the software. It's up to you. Changing it up can help you escape some of the burnout. And the final B is boredom. I don't know about everybody else, but sometimes after a while I get bored with certain things. And I need to change it up. I need to switch it up. Uh, in Disrupt Yourself by Whitney uh, Johnson, got it, kind of a link there, not a link, but I got a little attribution there at the bottom. She talks about this S-curve. And your S-curve, you start off, you, you really don't know what you're doing, but you're, you're, you're working on it, you're learning it, and you start having a, there's, there's a period of time where you really start to increase in the amount of things that you're, you're grasping from this. You're struggling through it maybe a little bit in the, in the first start of it. But as you're in, engaged in learning this technology, the amount of understanding that you get in that particular topic just accelerates. It feels like you're really on this, I'm learning something new every day. I'm excited to come into work. But then after a while, you start to become an expert. You start to peter out a little bit. And some of this may go back to the burnout. Um, you've basically grown, so you have some kind of a mastery of that particular topic. You've got confidence, and you've reached the end of that hyper growth cycle. So the next thing to do is something similar to basically what I just talked about to avoid the burnout, is you switch to another S-curve. Switch to machine learning. Switch to embedded systems. Switch to something else that can actually help you stay engaged. Maybe the optimization stuff is just what you were looking for. Maybe it's that itch that just needs to be scratched. So as you do this constant S-curve move, you actually grow in your mastery and in your value to the people that you work for and work with. Peter Diamandis said, if you don't disrupt yourself, somebody else will. In our day and age, disruption has almost become a, uh, a regular occurrence. And so as we look at what are we going to do, what's our next move, we should look at how can we disrupt ourselves? So disrupt yourself on your terms and plan it like a chess move. Thank you. Any questions? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, the question is, 
uh, you see a lot of people nowadays, they look at, um, it looks like they're basically job hunting, pursuing that, that salary increase every bump. They're, they're basically pursuing the first bump and not necessarily looking at the other two bumps per se. Um, are you responding or are you asking a question? Okay, is it related to this one? Okay, I'll answer this one first then. Uh, so my answer would be that at some point you're gonna, you're gonna reach the top of, being, of doing those things where I've got this experience and I'm chasing that salary, but at some point employers are gonna start looking at you saying, well, you've been at this company for six months and this one for a year, eventually it's gonna burn you. Um, you might be able to get away with it for a while, but I think at some point, chasing the money is not going to, to lead to long-term satisfaction. And that's really what uh, the experience map and uh, some of these other tools are designed to help you do, is to not pursue the money per se, but ex instead pursue the experience and pursue the opportunities to connect and help uh, serve the people that you're working with as well. Right, so the question is, if I can condense it, um, how do you weigh the different options that you, the, the different criteria that you've got? How do you kind of rate them and rank them when in some cases that might be a little nebulous or difficult to ascertain? So for example, the, that you brought up was culture. Um, in some respects, it's experience. And uh, I, when I've, I've interviewed at a couple of companies, I interviewed with a couple of companies maybe a year or two ago and as, as I was walking through that company, I, uh, I got, for, for lack of a better word, I got a vibe, which is a terrible metric, right? Vibe high. <laughs> who, who does that, right? But um, as I looked at it, the feeling that I got as I was walking through the culture was, is this, how is this similar to other companies that I've been at? And, and when I looked at that, I was like, okay, the culture that I've got here is similar to this company that I was at beforehand. And so I'm going to expect the culture is probably very similar to that one. And so I'm going to rank them here based off of that feeling that I've got as far as comparison between the two different companies. And so in one respect, I have to say experience, which is terrible, another terrible answer to give you. Um, but in another one, you can, you can use other metrics to help. Maybe you know a couple of people that have worked there and you can start asking them questions that may help you get a better sense or a feel for the culture. Um, it's much easier to rank things like on a, if we were to go back to here. The core hour ones, that's pretty simple. That's pretty easy to answer. Uh, if I were to bring up, let me see. Let's, yeah, the idea is to take as much subjectivity out of it as you can. But if we were to look at, let's go to there, there. And once again, if you go to the, the website, well, I posted, I posted the spreadsheet on the website. So that's all I'm doing is I'm bringing up the spreadsheet that I used, um, that, that I posted there. So here are some of the questions that I've got for, for me. So financial, right? That's really, to, to answer your question, Leah, that's kind of along the lines of financial. Do I have enough to support my family? That's great. That's how I would rank it. Not chasing necessarily the next salary bump. Uh, benefits, time off, unlimited. Who doesn't want unlimited time off, right? That's a five. So if you guys just said you don't want unlimited time off, okay, I'm gonna ask you why. Um, commute, is it a good commute? Is it a bad commute? How does that commute look? Social, professionalism. This professionalism, and this kind of goes to your culture question. How can you judge backbiting, right? That's difficult. Maybe you have to go at it from a little bit more of a circumspect kind of an answer question. So do you find it easy to get along with other groups? Why or why not? Uh, what kind of barriers do you have to deal with? And as you listen to the responses to those questions, then you can start to gauge what their culture is like. So there are ways to get those answers, but you have to you have to kind of play with it. So asking them how long does it take to get a server installed after once you feel like once you have recognized that you have the need, 
That's a great question because that'll tell you how how much barrier and red tape, red tape and politics. That's awesome. So the question is, one, I worked for myself for a while. What are the benefits and perks as opposed to not working or and working for somebody else? So what are the benefits of working for yourself versus uh, working for someone else? So um, working for yourself is great as long as you have people paying you. As soon as you don't have people paying for you, it becomes very challenging really quickly. Um, and I was in that situation for about a year and a half where I didn't have anybody paying me for work I was doing, or they were paying me very little compared to what I was being paid before. So um, we lived off of savings for a while. I, I Just because I'm a glutton for punishment, I actually went and looked at the poverty levels for Utah and found out that I was living below the poverty level while getting paid to do work that I was not under the poverty level beforehand doing. So uh, in that respect, challenging. But the freedom that you get in your schedule is great. Uh, the ability to take off time when you want to is also good as long as you have backups for taking care of customer calls and requests when you're not available. Um, in, many, in many instances, the, um, the remote working stuff that we have going on now with many employers makes some of the benefits of working for yourself less enticing because you, you have an employer who is paying you a regular salary, and they may expect you to be putting in some core hours at certain times, but for people who are used to working from 12 to eight, that's much easier to do when you're working for yourself or working remote, as opposed to somebody who expects you to be in the office from eight to five every day. So there are certain perks in that respect that are great. Uh, working for somebody, as opposed to you, for yourself, it always I always feel like I am begging when I ask for time off. I hate begging. I, it always feels like it's an inconvenience for whatever reason. And so in, in that respect, that's difficult and challenging. One of the other things I struggled with as I was working uh, for myself was um, I got lonely, right? The social aspects, I enjoy the social aspects of working for a company. And there are ways of getting around that, but at the time I didn't know what they were. So if I were to do it again, I would get more involved in the community, more involved with people in, in the area who know. Um, so yeah, that would be my response to that is, it, it pluses and minuses, right? I'm not sure I understand. What was the outcome of going from self-employed to not? Right. What happened? What happened when I was working for myself? Um, so, I was, when I was self-employed, it was actually um, three of us, family company. Uh, my dad, my brother, and I were, were owners of this company, and we still are. And uh, my dad doesn't get a paycheck from it anymore. My brother does. Um, so the company is still going, barely limping along, because we have one customer that basically pays for his salary, and that's it. Um, at some point, if we were to get bigger projects from people who are willing to pay, we would probably go all in again. Um, but I would find ways of mitigating that um, with not just a single customer or two customers, but I would increase the customer base for sure. Um, I would probably also increase staffing to help support and handle some of the requests that had when we were on call 24-7 sometimes. Um, in the meantime, they're running the company. I stepped away. And uh, I went to work for one company and then another company, if you look at the graph of the chart. So ultimately, it's kind of, it, I don't want to say it died, died, but it's, it refuses to die. It's like a zombie. Other questions? All right, thank you.